Amen. Marsha, thank you for that this morning. That was, or this evening. Oh, this morning, this evening. That was beautiful. At least we're going to mess up right at the beginning. I just want to welcome you all to Rosemary Baptist Church for our Christmas Eve service. It's so good to see you guys here. Uh, I feel like we got all of the weight going to this side of the, of the church sanctuary this morning, but that's all right. It's good to see the left side as well over here. So good to see you all this morning. I just want to have a special thanks to those of us who are watching on Facebook Live. We wish you could be here with us in person, but we're glad that you have tuned in to watch us this evening. Um, there's two things I just want to call your attention to really quick to make sure that you have. Uh, one of them is a candle, and one of them is a bulletin. If you don't have a candle, if you don't have a bulletin, uh, you could just shoot your hand straight up, and somebody will grab one and come bring it to you. Uh, those things are just very important to us. And a candle, a bulletin, I see no hands, and that's what I'm talking about. So that's awesome. Well, let's turn our hearts to worship this evening uh, with our moment of meditation. This is our Christmas Eve call to worship, and it's in the form of a responsive reading uh, where I'll read in the fine print and we'll read in unison in the bold print. Uh, you could follow along in your bulletins. On this holiness of nights, we come joining the shepherds who are stunned by wonder on this most silent night, we come, our hopes and dreams, joining those of Mary and Joseph. On this night of carols and candlelight, we come, our glad songs, joining with the choirs of angels over us. We walk through the Christmas season steeped in happiness, under warm, glowing lights. But if we peer through all the extravaganza, we'll hear the soft cry of a shivering baby and feel the prick of divine joy. Born of poverty between the walls of a rickety barn and into the fragile arms of a nervous young mom, Jesus arrived unable to defend himself much less anyone else. Hosts of angels lighting up the sky, trumpeting the good news, shattering the silence with praise and glory to God. We found you on the outskirts of a crowded town, given the last remnant of space, wrapped in leftover cloth. Tiny, humble, helpless, offered. We kneel, overwhelmed, we almost missed you, even as we tried to celebrate you. We must pass through the glittering town square and open the city gate, walk toward the pastures of uncertainty onto a long, narrow road under a cold but starry sky, into the barn that's never been noticed, and to the manger that holds all the love of God. Amen. Call to worship the seating is hymn number 103, Away in a Manger. Let's all stand as we sing.
Let's pray together. Holy Father, we gather this evening celebrating the joy of the Christmas season. No doubt we have already been to parties and gatherings with friends and families. We have shared uh, a good few laughs and uh, probably more calories. And we are thankful. We are thankful for everything this season means. For the joy of presents, for the joy of presents with bows, for the joy of your Son. And all these things we give you praise. As we pause on this holy evening to worship you, help us to encounter the, again the gospel story of the Christ who came. Who came and was born in a stable and spent his first night in a feeding trough. Adored by his mother and worshipped by awestruck shepherds. As we come to you tonight, rekindle in our heart the joy of Christmas. Rekindle in our heart the joy of knowing you. And let this hour be truly an hour where we are called into your presence and experience your love. For we make this prayer in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Our carol of Christmas this evening is hymn number 94, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Let's stand together as we sing. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. For he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. 
And there were in that same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, an angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. But the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them in the heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. This is the good news of God. Thanks be to God. When this night is over And the star has faded And the angels fly I will look at you wonder dreaming of the first night when I heard you cry someday you'll take your tiny And with just a touch, you'll cause the blind to see. Someday, you will walk with strangers. But tonight I'll rock you Stay a while with me Someday they will call you Savior, hope of all the people, light and life divine, and someday you will speak the words and touch the hearts of many as you now touch mine you Hey! 
and all will be set free. Someday you will walk among us, but tonight I'll rock you. Stay a while with me. But tonight, let me rock you. Please stay a while with me. No, you did not want to hear me try that. I have that, you can be assured. <laughs> hey, I didn't need that. <laughs> we come now to the celebration of the Lord's meal together. There are three stations, two in the middle, one to my far left, your far right. The two in the middle are uh, identical. They'll be served by intention. The one to my far left, your far right, is for those of you who are very concerned about COVID and COVID-related illnesses. Perhaps you have um, a health issue, perhaps you have comorbidities, um, or perhaps you are immunocompromised. If that describes you, you will, be, you will feel much more comfortable over here um, where you will have individually wrapped um, communion elements. For those of you who are comfortable with how we proceed normally, we will proceed uh, down these two aisles. You will come and um, receive the bread and uh, receive the cup and go back to your seat. We at Rosemary welcome all God's children to God's table. And so if you have a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, whatever your church membership, you are welcome to come. We encourage you to come. In just a moment, I'm going to pray, and the deacons who are serving tonight will be coming up as I'm praying, um, and we will begin serving when I am done. Let's bow together. Lord Jesus, it is a sacred and holy mystery that we celebrate tonight. That your body, that you, became, you took on a body, you became human, a human being to be one of us, to save us. And so it is no surprise that you continue to remind us of how good you are through elements that we can know through our senses, through touch and taste. You come and you save and we are grateful. As we consume communion tonight, help it truly to be for us a time where we draw ever near to Christ. For Lord, it is in Jesus' name and in the power of the Spirit we pray. Amen.
everyone been served that needs to be served? Please join me as we pray. And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. I have noticed it, and maybe it was more pronounced in the past, or maybe it's just the circle of friends that I'm in, but I sense a bit of world weariness in our Christmas, in many Christmas celebrations this year. I, I hear that people are tired of all of the stuff that goes along with celebrating Christmas. And to be fair, there might be a reason for that. Some of you have, might have been to Walmart today. Now, there's this great Christmas song that we used to sing a long time ago. I don't hear it much anymore, but do you remember Silver Bells? I promise I will not sing. Silver Bells, Silver Bells, it's Christmas time in the city. It, and the, 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 course, and the verse goes, City sidewalks, busy sidewalks, dressed in holiday style. In the air, there's a feeling of Christmas. Whoever wrote that song has never been to Walmart on Christmas Eve because that is pandemonium. You have people in line for maybe, it will, it always feels like hours to me, but for most other people who don't have line, standing in line problems, it feels like hours to them. And they're standing in line looking for that last present, and maybe that present's out of stock, and they're really worried that they won't be able to find something for their loved one. And finally, they just grab the thing that's least offensive to give to their loved one, and now they're standing in line to check out, oh, I think I would be tired too. There are times, though, that life, busyness, even the wonder of Christmas that we celebrate when we gather together with friends and family can just... If you are in the crowd where you feel like Christmas has lost a little bit of its magic, a little bit of its luster, there's hope tonight. It isn't about getting older, and it isn't because you're, you're older than last year. It, it isn't any of those things. It just happens sometimes. But if you want to have Christmas feel wonderful again. It's time to reflect on a few of the things that Christmas inspires. Now, I know the story is probably legendary, but you, if you've ever been and seen Handel's Messiah performed, there is this little ritual in the Hallelujah Chorus and it's where people who, when the Hallelujah Chorus starts, the congregation or the, the gathered audience if it's a concert venue, stands. And the, why that happens is, the story goes like this, when the, the Messiah was originally released, the king was in attendance. And the king thought the Hallelujah Chorus was the most beautiful song he had ever heard. 
And so somewhere in the singing of it, he stood. Well, when the king stands, you stand. And since the king stood, everyone stood. And since everyone stood, now everyone stands. It's a wonderful story. Legendary, no doubt. But it reminds us of one thing that Christmas can inspire. It can inspire wonder. It, it can inspire expression. There are some truths that cannot be expressed in mere words. They need art to express or even an act to express. Tonight or in the morning, many of you will exchange gifts. And what you are really wanting to do is give a gift that gets the reaction, wow. Because that's how you feel about the person you're giving the gift to. You want to give a gift that reflects your feeling. And sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, and sometimes those feelings are actually beyond words. Well, that's the genesis of Handel's Messiah and much of the religious art you will ever see. But not only does Christmas inspire wonderful art, it, expire, it inspires generosity. Most people are more generous at Christmas time of year than any other time. If we see someone hungry during Christmas, we cannot stand it. If we see someone in need during Christmas, we can't stand it. If there is a child that we know of that will not have a present under his or her tree, we will solve that problem as quickly as we can because Christmas inspires our best generosity. I am a father of some really little children. And despite my advanced age, as my wife routinely reminds me, and I'm experiencing Christmas through the eyes of little people. And they understand very little. They don't understand that all presents are not for them. They don't understand much of any of the story. But they understand the lights. And they understand the balls. And when the lights are lit and they twinkle on the tree and the balls glimmer, their little souls light up. All struck wonder. Now you might ask, why? Why all of this? Why all this wonder? Why would 40,000 German soccer fans gather at a field to sing Christmas carols? Why? Because something on that night happened that changed everything. Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem. Joseph lived in Nazareth. Nazareth... Um, was a, a working man's town. There was a rock quarry nearby, and the word that is sometimes translated carpenter can be translated carpenter or mason. We're not sure what Joseph did for a living, except he worked with his hands and did hard work. We know that he was of the house and lineage of David, so he took Mary with him to be taxed. Now, my favorite reading of the gospel story from Luke 2 is the King James, just because I've known it my whole life. It's hard to know exactly what that event that called them to Bethlehem was. Was it to be taxed or registered? Uh, most modern translations will call it a census. Well, an ancient government would do a census for two reasons, military and economic. The economic reason, why would you register everyone for an economic reason? To tax them. So taxation, while probably not the actual event, it was probably because of taxation. They were going to be counted for taxation purposes, most likely. When, we don't know. Uh, Luke is a wonderful historian, but... The, this moment is a little bit up in the air because we're not sure what Luke means. It, the word that gets translated, the taxing that fir the first happened when Quirinius was governor of Syria could also be translated before. All we know is that when Jesus was born, Caesar Augustus ruled Rome, Herod the Great 
then it probably should be thought of as Herod the Terrible, was over Jerusalem, nearing his end. Now, there was an error in calculations about the dates when we went to an AD, a BC AD calendar. We lost two years somewhere. So that means I'm two years younger than everyone thinks I am. Um, so, and there's no year zero. It goes from BC 1 to the year of our Lord 1. So chances are, best scholars estimate somewhere in 3 BC, Jesus is born. And it's, it's almost an embarrassing story. This is not the stuff of legend, of myth, of kings. It's almost shameful. They make this trek to Bethlehem. And it's like Joseph didn't hire a really good travel agent. Why was there no place for them to stay? Well, the city was full, but this is a place of Joseph or Joseph's origin. Shouldn't he have some connection with someone? Apparently not. Shouldn't someone have cared that a woman was very much with child? Apparently not. And so by the end of this evening, Mary is in labor in a stable. And she does what any mother would do in that time after her baby was born. She wrapped his little limbs in cloths to keep them straight, and she made the best bed she could, a feeding trough. This is no place for a king. This is no place for the Savior of Israel, for Israel's Messiah, for the one who has come to rule and reign. No, it's none of those things. The angels make a proclamation. The angels say, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Lord is an imperial title. It's the same title Caesar would have used. Caesar would have called himself Lord of the realm. And I want you to imagine a good Roman hearing this story. Wait, whoa, you're telling me that some hick from the backwater of the empire who was born in a stable is the king. Right. It's almost embarrassing. But it happened. It's one of the wonderful things about the Bible. It just tells the story the way it was. It doesn't sugarcoat or hide the first people that got it about Jesus were shepherds. And they came. And they worshipped Him. Because they understood something. The amazing, the wonderful, the unbelievable has happened. Every year in New York City, in one of the suburbs, a church puts on a live Christmas nativity. And it is a big to-do. This one of those live nativities that has the camels and the donkeys, I mean, and, and, and not just any of them. They really go into it. Well, this one year they were going to go over the top with their live nativity. Not only camels and donkeys and all of this, but they thought the wise men needed something a little extra to set them off. And so they went to the Greek Orthodox Church and borrowed censers. You know, those little things, little balls that the Greek Orthodox use to have incense in their worship. And then the fellowship hall of their church, they lit the censers, and the smoke began to billow out, and they waited until they could walk, and this big train of smoke would follow them out. And then... As the smoke was billowing out of the censers, they walk out and the train of smoke followed them and it was like they had their own cloud machine of incense leading them to where Jesus was. What they did not realize was the billowing smoke from the censers from the Orthodox Church set off the fire alarm and sprinkler in their fellowship hall. And the fire alarm did what it was supposed to do. It called the fire department. And apparently it called lots of fire departments. And so along with the camels and the donkeys and the shepherds and the sheep 
and the wise men and the billowing smoke, yellow slickered firemen showed up at Jesus' birth. And the firemen figured out what was going on. They looked at the wise men and said, you wise guys are setting off alarms all over town. Well, that's what Jesus' birth did once people figured out what it meant. Herod was enraged. And all Jerusalem terrified with him because someone had a claim to the throne. God came in the flesh. Why? In one sense, God comes to reveal in the flesh, in Jesus Christ, to reveal who He is to us. Human beings are remarkable in that we always have an instinct to reach out for God. If you go to the most ancient cultures we can find, human beings have reached out toward God in some way or another. They've named God all kinds of things. Asherah, Baal, Vishnu. Some of their efforts are laughable. Some of them are downright scary. Some of them, like Plato, Plato's effort to try to understand God, people said, a Christian theologian said, the seeds of the gospel are in Plato's thought. But we can't get there. You see, God is unknowable because he's infinite. I am working with um, Ainsley on counting. And she does really well. And she asked me, after counting a lot, a lot, the other day, she said, Dad, how far do numbers go? So well, they just keep going. You can always add one more. And it made no sense to her. Well, exactly right. It makes no sense. Numbers just keep going. And if you can't get your mind around the infinite number of numbers there are, how can you get your mind around God? And even if you could get your mind around who God is, how would you describe him with words? Our language is wholly inadequate to describe the wonder that is God with our words. It's just not good enough. Billy Graham tells a story about a woman who was a missionary, and she was doing her work, and she was riding by, and she saw a man sitting by a bench with his head down. And she thought, maybe I need to go talk to him. But she was so busy, she didn't. And later that evening, pricked in the heart, she was, Lord, if he will be back there, I will talk to him. And so she made her way back to him the next day. And she found him sitting there. And she straightway went, sat down beside him, and started telling him about Jesus. And the man said, all my life I have tried to talk to him, but I've never known his name. His name is Jesus. God reveals himself to, work to us through him. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What John means is when God describes himself to human beings in a way that we could understand, he does it through Jesus Christ. Everything you need to know about God can be found in Jesus Christ. Everything. Why did... Jesus go through all of this. He came to destroy the works of the devil, the scriptures would say. You could also mirror image it. The things that the devil does are destruction. And he comes to fix the things that are broken. Someone gave little Abby some sunglasses, some paper sunglasses a few days ago. And she loved those things. She put them on her head and she was walking. That's his guy, his guy. And she was having the best old time. Then she came to me and she put them on my face. And I thought, I don't want to wear these things. And then I thought, if she's three, she won't remember my embarrassment at wearing these goofy glasses. So I'll put them on. I put them on and I wore the glasses for a little while. And then she took them and she went to the other room. About an hour, she comes back crying. The glasses are in pieces everywhere. Pretty sure she tore them up. But nonetheless, the glasses were in pieces everywhere, and she wanted me to fix them. And I'm like, I only have two pieces. The, most of the pieces are missing. I can't do anything with these glasses. I can't fix everything. But God can. God can fix every broken body, every body that has been damaged by a disease. God can fix. Every body that has received a diagnosis that is unpleasant, God can fix. Whether it this be in this life or the next, healing of this body belongs to God, and for all who 
have a relationship with the Christ who was born in the manger shall be made whole. Every broken heart will be made whole by our Lord. If you are above 30 years old, chances are you mourn someone or something. And some days you don't do it publicly, and some days you do. But the truth is, God has come to heal your broken heart. And you may receive healing for that broken heart in this life, but if not, that is fine. Because if you have a longing for something that cannot be fulfilled in this life, it is the best way of knowing you weren't designed for this life. You were designed for the next one. And if that was all God did, it would be wondrous. But He has come to destroy the power of evil which separates from us from Him. He has come to destroy the consequence of sin which destroys our lives. He has come to fix everything that has been broken. He has come for you. And so we gather this Christmas realizing that this God has come for us, to save us. And He's come to be with us. It is my favorite Christmas story. I probably tell it at least once a year. If you've heard it before, I apologize. Some of you have heard it before but would like to hear it again. So here it goes. Granddad walked into the house on Christmas Eve and he saw his grandson, Jeffrey. Jeffrey was in the plastic ring they called a playpen. And Jeffrey saw Papa and he put his little chubby hands up above his little red ball cap, and Papa saw his tear-stained cheeks and looked down, and little Jeffrey said, Out, Papa, out! And Papa reached down, and just before he swooped up little Jeffrey in his arms, Mom steps in, No, no, Jeffrey, you are being punished. Well, now what's Papa supposed to do? He can't pick him up. He can't just walk away. A little guy, I think he was being abandoned by granddad, and that'd be worse than the actual punishment he was getting from mom. And he can't sit in the same room and, I don't know, read a newspaper or something. What's he supposed to do? So Papa thought, and he thought, and he thought, and then it dawned on him. Very gingerly, he kicked his leg over the plastic gate and then kicked the other one, and he sat down in the middle of the floor in the playpen, picked up his little grandson and said, Okay, buddy, how long are you in for? I'm here with you. And the place of punishment didn't seem nearly as bad with Papa in it. Our God is with us. He's never going to leave us. You have not done anything bad enough to make God leave you. You will not do anything bad enough to make God leave you. He is, we are with you. Now and forever. So if you are missing the magic this Christmas, don't reminisce about Christmas as long gone ago. Don't pine for Christmas to be different this year. Accept the way it is, and then do something. Find someone. Find someone to share the goodness of God that you have experienced in your life. Whether it be someone in need, or someone who is alone, or just a family that you, want, that you enjoy being with. Find them, spend time with them, and share the goodness of God. And I promise you, The magic returns. His name was Pete Richards, and the story is that he was the loneliest man in town. Pete had once been in love, but by a tragic accident, the one he was in love with was taken from him. And so Christmas was indeed a chore for Pete. People came to his jewelry store, and as Christmas got closer and closer, it became more and more difficult. 
All Pete wanted to do was sell his jewelry, close up shop, and go home and read a book. Most of the time he was successful, but Christmas season was very hard. A few days before Christmas, a little girl tiptoed her way into his jewelry shop. And she says, can I see those stones? It was a necklace. And he said, why, sure. And he picked them up and he showed them to her. And she said, I want to buy them. Pete had a, a wry grin. And she dumped out all the money she could find and she dumped it on the counter. It was all coins. And something about her blonde hair and blue eyes reminded him, well, he didn't even want to think it. And he looked at her and he said, oh, you know what? That's just enough. And so he put the stones in a box and he wrapped them up and he gave them to her so she could give them to her big sister as a Christmas present. Christmas Eve came and a frantic mother came running in said, did these stones come from the store? And he said, why, yes, they did. And she said to him, are they real? And she, he said, well, I mean, they're not the finest of quality, but yes, they are real. And she said, did she buy them from you? And he looked down at the girl, recognizing her face, and thought, well, well yes, she did. How did she get the money? He said, the price is a private matter between the buyer and the seller, ma'am. And she thought, how, how can I... And he said, you know what? I don't have anyone to give this kind of gift to this year. Let me, let this happen. And let me walk you home. And there underneath the, the ringing of the Christmas bells, he walked the mom and her little girl home, carrying a gift to her sister whom he had never met. And in that moment, the loneliest man in town had just a glimmer of Christmas magic. You can choose for your Christmas to be blah. You can choose to be weary of all the parties and the plates. You can be ch choose to be frustrated with how much you've spent. And you can choose to focus on the minutia. Or you can choose to see the mystery and celebrate it for what it is. God came in the flesh, and the world is changed. To quote the Hallelujah Chorus, the kingdom of this earth has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And that is Christmas. Holy Father, we praise you that Christmas has come, that in the darkness of this night we celebrate the light of the world. And for this evening, however our Christmas has gone, has it been lonely or sad or scary, or we've been overcome with worry, or we've been too busy, or it just hasn't had it for us this year, for right now, let us remember the wonder that is God becoming one of us. For we make this prayer in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Our carol of Christmas is number 91, Silent Night, Holy Night. Let's stand together as we sing.
behalf of Rosemary Baptist Church, it is my privilege to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Let's bow and receive the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.